Section 8.8, .8, Strengths of Covalent Bonds. If I have a covalent bond here between two chlorine molecules, and I break them apart into two chlorine atoms, and then find out what the heat of formation that was, then essentially the, in, the energy that's released by breaking apart these two bonds is not just the heat of formation, but it's actually the heat of it's the bond enthalpy. It's the enthalpy required to break the bond. How much energy is required or released to break a bond and how much uh, energy is required or released to then form a new bond. So if I have something like this and I test it, I could find out how much energy it takes to do this. Then I would know how much energy is actually stored in this bond. Okay, so bond enthalpy... And remember, enthalpy is delta H. Delta, delta H, it's, bond enthalpy is capital letter D, and it's the energy released or required to break a bond. If I have a methane, a methane molecule and I break it all up, well, there's four bonds here. There's four carbon-hydrogen bonds. So if I could get the energy it takes to break them into carbon and hydrogen, which is the heat of formation of this molecule, then I know, well, if it, if it requires 660 joules of energy to do it, then each one of these must be one-fourth of that. So I can figure out little by little how much energy it takes to break a bond. Well, if I know all of the bonds, how much money, how much money does it take to break or, or put together a bond, then I can guess heats of formation of molecules that I don't have information for. If I don't have it in a book, don't I can't get it, at least I can come here, make a guess, uh, I can make an educated guess of how much energy is released or required. If you remember Hess's Law, Hess's Law said it doesn't matter how many steps that you break something in, if you've got, if you've got reactants here on the left and you've got products here on the right, and this is the heat of reaction, the heat of reaction can be made up of breaking all the bonds into its bond enthalpies and then forming the new bonds with its new bond enthalpies and then putting them together. The only reason you would not do this normally instead of using heats of formation is because these are all averaged. These are the averages of gases, of gas phases, and it's not maybe not exactly what you are specifically using in your case, but it makes a good uh, like a shorthand or a good guessing, a uh, way to make a good educated guess as to how much energy you're talking about. So here are the average bond enthalpies. So these are of various different types of, uh, of compounds and at different phases. So some are liquids, some are gases. So, um, so this is a good guess of what it is. If you were to break the methane down that we saw a minute ago, you're going to get 415 kilojoules per mole to break all of the four bonds. Well, here specifically, the average is going to be 413. So you may not know your specific case, but you can get in the ballpark by using average bond enthalpies. The other thing that is the other information that you can get from these average uh, bond energies is the bond lengths. The more energy it takes to break a bond can suggest how close that that bond is. So, for instance, a single bond has an average bond length of 1.54 angstroms. A double bond is closer at 1.34. A triple bond is even closer at 1.2. So that suggests that the, the, the more electrons that you can share in a, between two atoms, the the more the more energetic it is and the closer it is so it's not just stronger it's not just stronger but it's also closer the shorter bond length 